Well, good morning, church. Um, thank you for clicking on the link and joining into our little, what's going to be our little Sunday morning broadcast. I would love to tell you that you're watching this live, but obviously you're not. Um, would you believe it? My phone line has been disconnected. So I've got no landline and I've got no internet. First time in my adult life, I think I've not had any internet and it's in the middle of, of a lockdown. So I'm having a wee... Uh, problem trying to Skype people, trying to FaceTime people, and and I can't even watch Netflix. You know, it really is a, a crisis now, isn't it? So, um, something that I'm just kind of pre-recording, just a wee message that I wanted to bring to you. But before I do that, let me just let me just take a minute. Better um, better sanitise the old hands, hadn't I? Because this is what we're doing now, isn't it? We've all got to make sure that we're washing our hands. We've got to make sure we're getting the antibacterial gel on. I've got my wee bottle here along with my cup of tea, which is nice. But I mean, it cost me, it cost me like a thousand quid or something to get something like that. So um, people are looking for hand gel nowadays like it's the Ark of the Covenant. Sorry. Might seem a little bit strange to interrupt what I'm doing in order to wash my hands. But... Actually, the thing I wanted to speak about today was was a quite a famous story in the Bible where someone else stopped what they were doing in order to wash their hands. It's a story that I'm sure you've all heard. You maybe can't think of it right off the top of your head, but I'm sure as soon as I mention it, you're going to remember. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Matthew 27 and verse 21. Verse 21, Matthew 27, 21. And if you don't have your Bible with you, why don't you just push pause and go and get it? Because you're at home. And if you don't have a Bible at home, then we've probably got bigger things to talk about, don't we? Matthew 27, 21. Then Pilate, the governor, said to the Jews, Which of these two men do you want me to release for you? And they said, Give us Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said to him, But why? What evil has this man done that he should be crucified? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but instead a riot was beginning, he took a basin of water, and he washed his hands in front of all the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, Let his blood be on us and our children. And then Pilate released to them Barabbas and sent Jesus to be scourged and delivered over to be crucified. Before Pilate sentenced Jesus to death, he stopped to wash his hands. Let me just ask a question. Why did Pilate wash his hands? Well, I think the reason Pilate washed his hands is because he was about to do something that he knew wasn't right. He was about to do something that he knew was the wrong thing to do. He said to these people in Luke's gospel, he says, when I, when I spoke to Jesus, I find no fault in him. This man's done nothing. He said there, this man has done no evil. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent and therefore didn't want to kill him. And this, this is a huge statement to come from, from Pontius Pilate. Because one of the things we know about Pontius Pilate from two Jewish historians is that Pilate was very cruel and very ruthless. And and he was, he was often known for sentencing people to death who hadn't even been tried, people just who were accused, and just to keep the peace, to, to satisfy himself, to show his own power, he would have people sent to death who, who hadn't even stood trial. So Pilate, you know, Pilate had no issue at all crucifying someone who had done nothing wrong. It just, it wasn't an issue to him. But something about Jesus... Something about Jesus stood out to him. Something about Jesus struck him. Maybe it was something his wife had said to him. You know, she had a dream about him. Maybe it was maybe it was something he got from just being in Jesus' presence. But something about Jesus told him that this man was innocent. And this man didn't deserve to die. And sentencing him to death would be the wrong thing to do. 
So when Pilate found himself in that situation, when he was just about to sentence Jesus, he washed his hands. And what he's saying by doing that is he's saying, I am, I am washing away the responsibility of this. He's saying, this isn't on me. It's not on me. I'm the one making the decision, but it's not on me. It's on you. And, and you know, sometimes, I think sometimes we, we think life's a little bit like that, that we can just wash away the responsibility we have. You know, we can say what we want, do what we want, treat people the way we want and just go, you know, oh, I'm, I'm washing my hands of this. this. This isn't on me. This is on you. This is somebody else's problem. But, you know, it, life's not like that, is it? We cannot just wash our hands. We cannot just say, sack it, I'm not taking the responsibility for this. It's not the way that it works. Let me ask another question. If Pilate really knew that Jesus was innocent and he really, he really didn't want to crucify him, then why did he? Why did he do it at all? Why did he... Why, was he, why did he allow himself to be led that way? Why did he feel the need to wash his hands? If he knew it was so wrong, why didn't he just say, no, nah, no, nah, I'm having nothing to do with this, let him go. He was a governor. He, he, he had the power and the authority to make that decision to free Jesus. He had the military might behind him to support his decision. Pilate could have had his own way. So why did he do what he did? Why did he send Jesus to the cross knowing that it wasn't the right thing to do and not even wanting to? I think the answer to that is Pilate was afraid. He was a cruel man, but he was also a weak man. And he was afraid. You see, Pilate had already got into trouble once or twice with Caesar, the emperor. And he was kind of on his last legs with him. And when Pilate looked out and saw the Jews starting to riot, starting to cause trouble, he, he's thinking to himself, if I lose control of this, if I lose control of another situation, if there's another riot... Then, then Caesar's going to come down here and he's going to give me a slap. And you know, you know, Pilate was Pilate's wife was actually Caesar's granddaughter. She was the granddaughter of the emperor. And, and so we kind of get this this glimpse. That actually, you know, the only reason Pilate's held on to his power this long is because he's married in. So he kind of knows he's on his last legs. He's just hanging by a thread, and he's afraid. He's afraid that if he lets Jesus go, if he does the right thing, then, then he's going to lose control. He's afraid he's going to lose his power, his position, his authority, his lifestyle is going to take a hit, his wealth might take a hit. You know, he might even he might even come under some serious punishment. Um, Pilate's afraid that if he does what he knows to be right, it's going to cost him. So he goes against his own conscience and he does what he knows is wrong. And and having said these couple of things, this kind of brings us back around to our situation that many of us are in. Because we are, we're all a little bit afraid, aren't we? We're all a wee bit afraid of what's going on in the world. It's something, we've never really seen anything like this before and we're... We're worried about our jobs, we're worried about paying the bills, we're worried about our, you know, the kids at school and school lunches and, you know, we all know people who are vulnerable, a lot of us are vulnerable and there is fear setting in, fear setting itself upon our society and, and like Pilate realised, sometimes when we are afraid, it becomes easier to do things that we know are wrong. When we are afraid, it becomes a whole lot easier to to try to wash our hands of the responsibility we know we have to do good. The responsibility to put other people first. The responsibility to think of others more than we think of ourselves. When we're afraid, we often make the wrong decisions. We often make bad decisions. Crisis, unfortunately, always reveals character. And church, we are in a crisis right now. And it is going to start showing people some stuff about us. So having said that, I would like to just encourage you 
to be mindful of your own fear, of your own anxiety at this time, but also to be mindful of your responsibility, your responsibility to do good and be aware that that anxiety you have might just cause you to make decisions that might be good for you, but might be bad for other people too. And just to counter this, let me just offer you a, a couple of quick suggestions about ways that we can maybe keep on top of our own selfishness during this time. Um, first of all, can I just encourage you to stay connected? You know, stay connected with your mates, stay connected with your church friends, uh, the people, your family members, and that people that, who support you, that you rely on su to support. You know, you might be fine. You might just be fine sitting at home in the evening, self-isolating, you've got Netflix, you've got PlayStation, you've got Justy. You might be happy and not concerned, but the people that you know and you love might really be struggling. People, there are people at this stage who are really, really struggling with what's going on. So connect with them. Phone them, get them on Skype, get them on FaceTime. Let them hear your voice. Let them see your face because you might be the first person they've spoke to in a little while. They might need you now. So stay connected. The other thing I'd like to suggest to you is that you try to get to know your neighbours. Remember who your neighbours are. These people might not be your best friends. They might not be your church mates. But, you know, try, try and remember who lives across the road, who lives next door. Um, you know, that wee old lady who, who's, who's just kind of around the corner. Has she got anybody? Is she alone? You know, maybe just maybe just decide that you're going to become the unofficial secret pastor of your own street. You're going to pray for them. You're going to inquire about them. You're going to see if you can help them. You're going to try and connect with them. Just, just decide that those people around you, who you may not know just yet, are, are in your little flock and you're going to shepherd them. You know, we, we serve Jesus Christ, who's a great shepherd, and we are under shepherds in... Uh, and and let us just ask Jesus to increase our own little flocks a little bit. Give us people that we can care for because, you know, there's probably people in your street who've got nobody caring for them. So, so keep an eye out for them. And the last thing I want to just encourage you to do is look for ways to do good. Try to create and think about ways that you can do good. It's easy to sit back, to switch off, to wash our hands of the responsibility that we have because the situation calls for it. No, no, no. Think about ways to do good. You know, there's, there's more rag across the road to kind of get down to boots for a prescription. Maybe you could pick it up for her. the family next door. Their kids only gone to school and they've lost those lunches and they're struggling. Maybe just chuck them a bag of groceries or something over the fence. Look for ways to do good. If you've got so much toilet paper in your house that you've had to start charging it rent, then maybe you're in a position just to bless somebody else, just to help somebody who may have a little bit less and who may be on lockdown a little bit longer than you. Think about ways to do good. Think about ways that we can bless one another. I've said it once, but crisis always reveals our character. So let us make sure that during this crisis, our church rises to the occasion and shows the world something of the love of Jesus Christ, of the peace of Jesus Christ, of the compassion of Jesus Christ. Let us rise to the occasion, church. This might very well be our finest hour. Father, I want to thank you for the love and the unity that we have as a fellowship at Harrogate Elam, God. And Lord, I just pray for everyone who's watching this, God, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, and, and Lord, that you would stir up acts of kindness and mercy and compassion and each and every one of us. Help us not to be driven by fear. Help us to do good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, church. Love you. Stay safe. God bless.